I think now it's time, so let's start today's seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Alexander Tomalok from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He will talk about the interesting topics, status of proton lattice puzzle, QED radiate correction for accelerator neutrinos. Please start. Hi, you. everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation, of course, and I will cover my main two research directions. Uh, I'm working more on neutrinos nowadays, but uh, this subject is also quite interesting. And let's start and take a look on history of the proton radius puzzle. It's all started quite a long time ago, but uh, origins came even before. So the traditional tool to study protons and to study, to extract their charge is the scattering of electrons or muons on proton target. And as we know from courses, such scattering quite well described by the exchange of just one photon. Uh, the vertex here with lepton is known analytically, it's just the vertex gamma mu. And uh, the most general covariant form for proton vertex in case of two onshore protons is given in terms of Dirac and power different factors. Having uh, this expression in one photon exchange approximation, we can write down uh, helicity amplitude or just amplitude of this process as product of a lepton current and proton current. And by this, we can, from starting from this expression, we can calculate any types of observables. I would like also to point that uh, electron proton scattering is just simple two to two process. And two to two processes depend only on two independent kinematic variables. These are lepton energy in the proton rest frame and the momentum transfer square difference of momenta on one of these two lines. So having this expression, we can calculate simplest observable and polarized cross-section. Uh, in experiment, people write it in terms of electric and magnetic form factor. With this electric and magnetic form factor, they are just Fourier transforms of magnetization and electricity inside the proton in non-relativistic systems and uh, where they have nice interpretation. Advantages cross-section is given by square of magnetic form factor and electric form factor square uh, with some kinematic refactor between them. Tau related to the momentum transfer and epsilon is a uh, uh, parameter which is related to scattering angle. For angles uh, uh, forward scattering zero, epsilon goes to one and for backup scattering epsilon goes to zero. So if we plot for fixed momentum transfer, cross-section is function of this parameter epsilon. From the slope, we determine electric form factor. From offset, we determine magnetic form factor. When we go into small momentum transfer, then electric form factor dominates cross-section and uh, proton, form fact proton charge radius extracted mainly from electric form factor when momentum transfer is small. First of all, let's take a look at definition of the proton charge radius. Conventional definition is derivative of electric form factor with momentum transfer at momentum transfer is zero. In case of electron proton scattering, uh, uh, the result, proof result before maybe a couple of years ago is uh, this number. And the most precise data for electric form factor at low momentum transfer comes from experiment A1 in Mainz. Uh, this data, if you see on, on this piece, it's rich, has reached percent precision or even sub percent precision, which allowed to extract the radius with a very good accuracy. Here, data is normalized to standard dipole form, which can be shown in textbooks. Also, we see that there, there are some deviations from standard dipole form. Uh, besides, uh, this traditional way to extract from factor from electron proton elastic scattering. The other way was developed in the uh, 90s, was realized in the 90s. Uh, it's uh, the way from atomic spectroscopy. Uh, first of all, uh, in spectroscopy of regular hydrogen and deuterium, if we consider shift of, uh, if, if we consider energy level of S state, uh, the charge radius contributes to shift of the states, and here n is principal quantum number. 
we can invert this problem, measure uh, frequencies or energy levels in hydrogen, transition energies, and extract from it from factors, and it was possible in the 90s. And uh, the combined result from hydrogen and deuterium spectroscopy in, in the or time of origin of this puzzle was in very good agreement with electron proton scattering result. But something happened in 2010, and what happened, there was first measurement of muon hydrogen lamp shift uh, in, muonic in muonic atoms, which allowed to extract charge radius with 20 times better accuracy. And it was a big surprise that these two numbers uh, differ with significance around 5-7 sigma. The reason that we have much better accuracy from just the first measurement of lamp shift is to S to P transition. Uh, the main reason is that muons are much heavier and they are much closer to proton. And that's why the field was going on inside the proton uh, much better. It was the status around 2010. And after this, of course, many theoreticians and experimentalists started to study this problem, and new experiments were performed. And here I would like to mention, uh, yeah, first of all, yeah, it's puzzle, there is difference. Uh, and first of all, I would like to, to, to mention some of these experiments uh, and, some, uh, uh, and some updates since 2010, 2012. Uh, in electron proton scattering, this, like, this are quite complicated experiments, uh, and the first uh, to realize them, the first motivated by radio puzzle results came in 2019, so it took nine years. But many groups were analyzing data uh, from mines, and uh, some groups were claiming smaller radios. And the main, mainly groups which used smaller momentum transfer region get smaller radios, with large people who used larger momentum transfer region gave uh, obtained uh, larger radius. Uh, in field of uh, spectroscopy, there were quite a lot of measurements last decade, and first of one of them was done in Garching, Germany. It's nearby Munich. The, the measure, people measured transition between 2S and 4P state and extracted charge radius, which shifts S states. In from this measurement, is this measurement gave result in agreement with smaller radius from muonic hydrogen spectroscopy. The other measurement was uh, performed uh, in Paris of 1S, 3S transition, again, charge radio centers. And surprisingly, new measurement in Paris gave larger radius in contradiction with this measurement in Garchen. How about the accuracy? Uh, to... Accuracy of this one and this one is larger than combined accuracy and larger than, than accuracy of this one. Yeah, uh, but uh, it's larger, not more than factor two, factor of one point something. And exactly question of accuracy is a very important question. And uh, uh, it is ac accuracy from hydrogen spectroscopy. Uh, this result is a result from combination of many transitions. And that's why atomic physics people started to push one single experiment to this level of precision. And group in uh, Canada, in York University, uh, performed measurement with of traditional lamp shift in regular hydrogen, 2019, uh, with uh, accuracy of, uh, of this size, as uh, accuracy of combination of all measurements. And the, the, what's important that for regular uh, regular lamp shift, uh, the Rydberg constant doesn't enter this transition because n principal quantum number is the same and it's directly sensitive to charge radius. And since this transition was measured precisely and it gave result in agreement with smaller charge radius, we can make conclusion that problem is definitely not in Rydberg constant and most likely charge radius is small. So this result is, was very, very conclusive. After this, atomic physics community started to think slightly differently. I will tell it uh, on in a couple of slides. And the other experimental measurement which I should uh, tell here is a measurement of electron-proton scattering. 
at Jefferson Laboratory in Virginia in the United States. Uh, in this case, electrons were scattered on hydrogen target. Electrons were scattered of energy one and two GeV uh, in very forward direction. And by measurements of form factors, uh, people have extracted charge radius. And again, in this case, charge radius was extracted from uh, electron scattering uh, with a smaller value uh, as from ionic hydrogen. So right now it looks like field moves to the direction of smaller values of charge radius. Here, this result from a uh, Pirat co collaboration and muonic hydrogen result, this new updated result from York uh, University compared to older determinations. And uh, after York result, the spectroscopy community realized that there, is, there was some systematics, unaccounted systematics in measurements in regular hydrogen spectroscopy. That's why uh, it's right now there is no big problem in atomic physics. The problem more moved to experimental side, how people analyze data. Regarding electron-proton scattering data, there is experiment Pirat from JLab. There is Mind's experiment. Uh, there are some tensions between data sets. And uh, this problem is not still resolved. And uh, we will see what's going on. Uh, okay, so there is some problem, and uh, what's explanations of this problem? Uh, since uh, I already told, there can be drawbacks in experiment, but not in just one experiment, in quite many of them. And of course, uh, if there is problem, many theoreticians started to work on it, and many group uh, reevaluated radiative corrections in spectroscopy, in scattering. And in particular, there was a lot of focus on two-photon exchange corrections, which I was working in and will tell slightly <laughs> more. But since people here more like BSM physics and dark matter, uh, there were some exp beyond standard model explanation. So from the beginning, here we have electrons and muons, which couple, which interact with proton uh, differently. Interaction can be due to exchange of some, some force between these particles can be vector, scalar, or some other type of interaction. The simplest case, uh, if we have vector particle, uh, besides pre precise muon proton results or electron proton scattering, in case of electron proton scattering precision, like around percent level, but we know that there is G minus two of muon, which measured very precisely up to part per milli, even better accuracy. That's why such a carrier should be Protophilic, there should be protophilic interaction, and uh, by studying constraints uh, on uh, both G minus two and proton radius, people concluded that the force should be uh, the, the the force particle should be of order of MeV scale. Uh, besides this, uh, this if it's vector particle, it's not enough to have just vector couplings. People also added uh, Excel. Excel type of coupling to explain both uh, proton radius and G minus two. And uh, in this paper, people studied also constraints from all other nuclear physics and particle physics experiments. Uh, there were also some uh, extensions of simple models to renormalizable model in the paper of Carlson and Fried. And the last update before my, before York result of lamp shift was uh, by in paper of Jerry Miller employed and that person Leo and they found the way how to explain proton radius with exchange of scalar particle. Yeah, besides after this date, uh, after this year and the new upcoming measurements, <laughs> interest to these problems from BSM community in decreased since. Uh, it looks like more there is problem with measurements. Uh, I was involved in radiative corrections and this uh, problem of proton radius brought some interesting updates I will go in to talk about. In particular, it's uh, related to two photon exchange correction. Uh, the discrepancy between two results in 2012 was around 300 micro electron volt uh, in units of electron volt for muonic hydrogen. Contribution of this graph is just 
one tenth of this discrepancy, so contribution is not small. But what's important that experimental uncertainty of measurements in ionic hydrogen was 2.5 microelectron volt. And in theory, we have uh, uncertainty also around 2 microelectron volt. So that's why uh, theoretical improvements of this graph in general are of interest. And the main problem that the physics of hadrons, which enters here, it's uh, non perturbative. And uh, the best so far approach is to rely on experimental data and use dispersion relation to the calculation of numbers, how much this diagram shifts energy levels. Uh, it was work of my PhD advisor and some other people. I did some revelations, but I was looking mainly on effects of this diagram on scattering. Uh, in first start with electron proton scattering. This diagram uh, is not included into standard packages of radiative corrections, again, due to the problem of hard hadrons intermediate states, only soft part when uh, virtuality of one photons goes to zero is inside radiative corrections, and because this part is needed to cancellation of infrared divergences. According to experimental studies, extractions of charge radius are not very sensitive to model of two photon exchange, but uh, Besides charge radius, we extract also magnetic form factor. And to understand it from a theoretical point of view, uh, it motivates to study this diagram. Okay. So, you, so one, this, uh, yeah, here. So I think the, in the bound state problem, you, this one button exchange is uh, kind of a radar diagram is replaced by a shading between uh, Right. Right. This guy contributes as contact interaction. The, 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 this diagram uh, contributes as contact interaction at no origin. Overlap. Yeah. No overlap with the... There is no, it, it's subtracted. So, 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 yeah, there is overlap in infrared with the bound state problem, but this infrared piece is subtracted in calculation. So when we calculate here proton intermediate state, this part is included in solution of Schrodinger equation. But if we subtract uh, this diagram with couplings one here and one here, then we don't have double counting from solution of Schrodinger or Dirac equation and the calculation of this diagram. Is it a question? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so I believe this part is partially in solution of Schrodinger equation. That's why there is some infrared subtraction when people calculate shift of energy levels. You, you have some way to sometimes yes. avoid this overlap. Yes, exactly. Uh, right. Okay. Yes, there is a well defined way how to do it. At least for two photon exchange, I know it very well. Uh, and uh, so this blob, mm -hmm. this blob, it's proton pi on pi. Yeah, it's proton, pion, nucleon, two pions, nucleons, resonances, uh, and then also DIS region. So, for example, two photon going to eta region. Uh, this here, eta? Yeah, eta. And yes, that, yes. That it's, to, uh, it, 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 it's also included. It, it, it is also included, actually. It is also included. Uh, I, 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 I don't show it like this diagram slightly triangle okay. should be, but... Uh, it's also included in uh, T1 forward compound scattering amplitude. There is subtraction function, which uh, describes this contribution. And the contribution is small? Uh, it's not negligible. It's main source of uncertainty. No one knows how to describe it correctly. And nowadays, people do it from some phenomenology ways, this combination of dispersion relation and energy physics. People do it with chiral perturbation theory mm -hmm. calculations, and people try to start to do it with lattice, but lattice doesn't provide good results for this yet. Yeah, this, 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 this diagram you mentioned is main source of uncertainty nowadays. Yeah. Because other contributions of resonances, they're directly related to experimental data. You would integrate experimental data from in dispersion relations, and then it works. But for this one, yeah, it's problematic. Thanks. Can I go? Oh, okay. Yeah. 
so I, I will talk about two photon exchange for scattering. And besides parameters Q squared, epsilon, I define crossing symmetric variable. This variable changes sign between S and U channel crossing, but it's useful for dispersion relation analysis. The main contribution from two photon exchange graph is given by interference of one photon and two photons, and is proportional to real part of two photon exchange amplitudes. So we need to calculate, yeah, of course we can calculate just diagrams and cross sections, but theoretically it's better to study amplitudes themselves and we calculate real part of these amplitudes. At these low energies, uh, there are two approaches how to deal with two photon exchange diagrams. First one uh, is to model somehow this uh, low proton state and inelastic states and do calculation of loop diagram. Uh, but here we should do some always some assumptions about vertex and about intermediate states. Uh, the other way is to use dispersion relations. We cut diagram and relate all channels to experimental data. This problem, this is well-defined framework where you can add channel by channel by channel. But uh, the problem of dispersion relations is that uh, uh, there, are not, there is no information for all channels. Uh, on the other hand, dispersion relations satisfy main, main properties of quantum field theory. And for instance, if we consider just box diagram and include here on shell form factors, which is traditional calculation for of this diagram at low energies, then we neglect a form factor which describes on shell to off shell transition completely, it's problem. And also we violate unitarity. In case of just proton intermediate state, numerically these violations are very small, but if we consider here delta state or resonances, then violation of unitarity leads to wrong behavior of cross sections at high energies. And that's why this uh, approach doesn't work well for re case of reason. If we put here resonances and model vertexes with resonances. However, for the scattering at, uh, in forward direction, this approach still can be applied and uh, to provide model independent prediction of leading in in momentum transfer terms. And for this, we did calculation. We uh, modeled this uh, Compton tensor as forward double virtual Compton scattering tensor and evaluated this amplitude from experimental data and then corrections to uh, cross sections. And uh, here I would like to say that this diagram with triangle, its contribution proportional to mass of lepton and its uh, very small for electron proton scattering, but not for muon proton scattering and not for muonic atoms. Uh, in this case, calculation is done in terms of unpolarized proton structure in resonance region. Structure functions of proton measured very well uh, at Jefferson Laboratory. Sorry, uh, what is Compton tensor? Uh, Compton tensor is tensor uh, photon scatters on uh, some particle and then photons goes out. So you need the tensor. Tensor, I mean, the, here this photon couples with gamma mu. Here it couples with gamma nu. Okay. If uh, if it is uh, just a uh, just Dirac particle, but uh, it, 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 in general, so it's like a four point vertex. No, uh, in, in general, like if you have here propagator of photon G. G Mu yeah, yeah. G menu, you have contraction of two tensors, L menu mm -hmm. and some W menu. And this tensor W menu called Compton tensor. Okay. In general, it's form where like there is tensor decomposition with some invariant amplitudes in front of some tensor structures. And these invariant amplitudes are studied in detail. For UED case, you can calculate them like analytically for case of protons, different resonances contribute and different states contribute to this components. Is there any solution to the application of these three kicks uh, you are showing? Of what? Three kicks on the, on the right plot. Ah, this one? Yeah. Actually, this is illustration of resonance physics. 
its function of incoming photon energy of uh, total, total photo absorption cross section on proton. So it's like gamma p. It's uh, and for cross section you square it. Gamma p is the same side. It, it's simple simplest case of forward scattering, but uh, to describe uh, and, and here it uh, it's for real photons, but uh, in calculation of it, 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 there is data also for uh, photon for virtual photons or on uh, objects which describe this block on the hadronic tensor. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but this calculation works only at small scattering angles and what's going on going to arbitrary scattering angles is not, not completely clear. And in this for arbitrary scattering angles, we take, we cut this diagram and study intermediate state by intermediate state and advantage that this approach is based only on, on shell information first, and it does not violate unitarity. So the idea is pretty clear. We take one photon exchange amplitudes from experimental data. By unitarity, we write down imaginary parts of amplitudes. Then we use dispersion relations in this variable new I talked before, and we reconstruct real parts as integrals from imaginary parts. Uh, obtain real parts of two photon exchange amplitudes and provide predictions to cross sections. It looks very simple, but there are problems, and these problems are solved in different ways. First problem is problem of analytical continuation. The problem is that this integral starts from some threshold, but experimental data doesn't cover all integral. In experimental data starts from some other value of new. That's why there should be analytical correlation of imaginary parts from part where we have experimental data to part where we don't have it. And it was solved differently by two different groups. The first group reparameterizes uh, form factors or amplitudes in terms of sum of monopoles and fits, uh, fits resulting in photon exchange inputs. And, 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 then, uh, by the, and then by this provides analytical continuation. Uh, we did in slightly other way. We developed two methods which allow to work directly with experimental data and make uh, analytical continuation. But these methods do not, we don't claim that they work for all arbitrary kinematics. At some point when the region of uh, between threshold of in, between uh, lower uh, low, lower limit of integration and the threshold of experimental data, if it's too much, our approach will not work. Uh, the case of uh, proton state is very, agreement is pretty, the, the results are pretty the same between these two approaches and also to previous way of calculation of diagram. But the main advantage of our work is that we were able to include pion and nucleon intermediate states and the may, the, we included it just because the pion pro, el, electroproduction amplitudes on protons were extracted by experimental collaborations from unpolarized cross-section and observables with polarizations of protons and final state nucleons. Uh, I have talked about two ways of calculate diagram with the approximation of forward uh, tensor forward uh, Compton tensor and uh, this using these amplitudes themselves. And here I compare these two ways at low momentum transfer. Two ways of calculation agree very well for scattering at small angles, large epsilon, where they should agree. So it was cross-check of our both calculations at the end. And by this, we provided the best so far knowledge of two photon exchange corrections at low energies. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. When you consider the pi and loop, are you also considering the con contribution of delta resonance? Uh, delta, I, I consider it slightly more than delta. So the point that delta, when it produces, it immediately decays to pi and nucleon. And this partial wave analysis, uh, this uh, amplitudes, they include delta and they include higher resonances. And besides resonances, they correctly, this uh, uh, 
uh, fit was correctly describes phases between resonances and non-resonance background. So this calculation is much more involved than just data itself. It's a proper treatment, but of just pion and nucleon state. Yeah. When you do this, uh, I mean, start to couple pions to the nucleus, mm -hmm. are you assuming the old chiral formation or a heavy bedroom chiral formation? And not exactly like this. Uh, Uh, there are, the, it's a decomposition partial wave analysis in, into partial waves and then fits for, so, yeah, it's partial wave analysis. It fits for different partial waves. Uh, and then technically what I do, I, I combine different partial waves into invariant amplitudes of uh, this process. So this process has six invariant amplitudes and I combine partial, actually not me, but program does it for me. It combines six. Uh, it, it combines some of all partial waves of this process into six invariant amplitudes. And to fit partial waves, people use uh, some bright Wigner form with uh, with chiral perturbation theory based inputs. But the advantage that uh, in principle, the way how fit is performed is not so important. As soon as I have numbers for amplitudes, I can do this calculation. And when you show this two bottom line, do you also include this? Group? Yes, I always include crops. Yeah, I apologize. I, I just don't show it. Uh, for the case of uh, imaginary part, uh, only this diagram has imaginary part, but when I write real, uh, when I write dispersion relation, it automatically accounts for both of them. Yeah. Yeah, so by this, we calculated all two photon exchange corrections uh, for low momentum transfer. And uh, at high epsilon, we can use our near forward calculation when we have all intermediate states. And at smaller epsilon, we, or actually arbitrary epsilon, we, we, we know uh, sum of elastic or proton and pionuclear intermediate states. And at the end, uh, we used this uh, two photon exchange with. Uh, People probably you you know here to extract uh, uh, form factors from the experimental data. I mean Gabriel and Richard, and uh, we did the extraction of form factor in Z expansion form, which uh, correctly describes uh, analytical properties of form factors, and also we used constraints on high energy behavior with Q squared, and. Um, What's interesting, uh, what we found that uh, for electric form factor inclusion of PIRAT data doesn't change the results too much, but uh, I have to say that we use also muonic hydrogen radius measurement as one data point in our feed. That is why uh, the fact that PIRAT data doesn't change uh, Things too much, it's just because we used already muonic hydrogen, very precise value of muonic hydrogen measurement as one of data points. And the other interesting finding, which is in principle not we were the first, but quite important finding that magnetic form factor with minus data shown here, without minus data is shown by this uh, curve. So with new minus data, there is some tension in magnetic uh, form factor. But by this, uh, all my previous studies of the photon exchange were included to new analysis of form factors and uh, which can be used in the future. Besides electron proton scattering, uh, I studied also muon proton scattering. It's not a very popular subject that was before 2010, but since uh, uh, proton radius can be extracted from ordinary hydrogen spectroscopy scattering and from muonic hydrogen spectroscopy and scattering, uh, there are very new proposals which are going to measure scattering of elastic muons on protons. And actually, there is related data uh, from experiment at PSI. These are pretty old numbers, but uh, right now they, they didn't publish data yet, but they took already some data and they still continue data taking. Experiment is performed uh, at three different energies at hundreds of MeV range. And I was interested, how about two photon exchange corrections in mu's? The main difference between these two cases is that we have mass of muon, which can be important. So when you 
talk about this low energy, low zero energy, it only includes the kinetic energy or? It includes what? It includes only kinetic energy. Uh, it's P, it's momentum. Kinetic energy. It's a uh, momentum, it's like P squared plus M squared, E squared is P. Like it's a uh, momentum of P. Like, uh, so it doesn't include the rest of energy, right? It doesn't include, does not. It doesn't rest energy. And you live long enough that you can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, if you boost it, uh, yeah, actually here you don't boost it too much at the end, but you still, it's, it lives 10 minus six seconds, but in this 10 minus six seconds, you still can do something. Yeah, and uh, I, I started to photon exchange corrections and I found that it's mainly given by proton intermediate state of this diagram with just box. And I found that in elastic intermediate states contribution is very small. And that there is difference between muon scattering and electron scattering. In case of electron scattering, correction turned out to be larger. The reason for this is that in case of muon scattering, you can flip helicity of uh, muon and uh, these contributions with flip without flip, they cancel each other significantly. Besides muon proton scattering experiment, there is experiment compass at CERN where people scatter muons of on energy hundreds to two hundreds of GV and they look at very, very forward going particles. Uh, in case of two photon exchange corrections, they are very, very small for this experiment. I was looking at two photon exchange also to in atomic physics. And in case of regular hydrogen, usually its contribution is small because it's suppressed by mass of electron. But there is one transition, one S to S transition, which measured much more precisely than any other transition in regular hydrogen. And uh, uh, from this transition, people determine it's the main transition which give us Rydberg constant. And that's why it's uh, crucial to also all this problem. The main point here is that uh, this transition is so much precise that this diagram starts to play a role. And if you calculate this diagram, it turns out to be 10 times larger than experimental uncertainty. And hadronic uncertainties from this diagram are of order of experimental uncertainty. And before my work, people did not include, uh, did not have calculations based on experimental data with resonances. So by this, I slightly contributed to Rydberg constant. Uh, besides this, in case of muonic hydrogen and electronic hydrogen spectroscopy, I would like to say that in case of muonic hydrogen lamp shift, people measured it precisely, extracted charge radius. Uh, the same experiment measured hyperfine splitting of S state. It's different between spin triplet and spin singlet states. Uh, precision of this measurement is roughly about theoretical uncertainty of two photon exchange from data calculations right now. But in future, there will be a measurement of ground state hyperfine splitting in muonic hydrogen with accuracy around uh, 200 times better than previous measurement and 200 times better than uh, two photon exchange, knowledge of two photon exchange correction. And for, in case of regular hydrogen, we know very precisely this ground state hyperfine splitting. And what I was working on, I related uh, ground state hyperfine splitting in regular hydrogen to hyperfine splitting in muonic hydrogen through this diagram with two photon exchange. Uh, in case of regular hydrogen, uh, this is also very precise measurement. It's well known in astrophysics 21 centimeter line. And it's so important that people even put it in golden plaquette and sent to look on at extraterrestrial uh, civilizations. But in case uh, what I did, I just took this number, added all framework of radiative corrections in regular hydrogen, muonic hydrogen, and uh, with the he help experimental knowledge of spin structure of the proton, I determined uh, the uh, ground state hyperfine splitting in muonic hydrogen. And uh, why it should be done? The main problem in uh, experiments with muonic hydrogen spectroscopy is that to 
fine transition, people should tune their laser frequency in such a way that transition happens. And that's why theoretical predictions uh, before experiment is performed are needed in order to save time before you look at, uh, before you find the line. Uh, so I would like to conclude uh, proton radius part. The first of all, it seems that honestly, puzzle dissolves with new measurements. And nowadays atomic physics community do not see the problems. There are still problems in scattering data. And it will be, of course, definitely interesting what's, what will be results of new muon proton scattering experiments. And uh, from my point of view, I did quite a lot of work on this diagram in, in region of hadrons. And uh, region with hadrons is very complicated. And the same diagram actually enters neutrino physics in case of neutrinos charge current scattering on nucleons. Uh, we can have also radiative corrections and we also have hadron physics. That's why I was involved uh, in the calculation of radiative corrections to this process. Uh, in, first of all, now I've switched to this other subject, neutrino physics, and uh, I will, would like to motivate this work. It's motivated by United States-based neutrino physics experiment Dune. Uh, there is also experiment nearby, Hyper-K, which is going to answer the same fundamental questions. These experiments look for proton decay, they look for explosion of supernova, and they are going to improve on measurements of so-called PMNS matrix, mixing matrix in the neutrino sector, and will determine squared sign of squared difference of uh, one and three neutrinos in mass basis. And the, more, the main important point is that they can uh, determine or rule out CP violation in the left-hand sector of the standard model. Yeah. So your last, last slide. Uh, yep. So the same diagram can also lead to the neutron decay, right? Yep. Yes, yes. Neutron... I'm working right now on neutron decay. <laughs> so there is anomaly, neutron decay anomaly, right? There is neutron decay anomaly, but uh, this diagram will not explain anomaly itself. It can provide better prediction for uh, a lifetime of neutron, definitely. And uh, yeah, it, it's exactly what I'm doing. Like there is exchange of photon, triangle diagram. Usually people consider boxes, but uh, at this energies you can consider triangles because it's kind of effective interaction. You don't have electric bosons at this low energies. Yeah, but it's the same diagram. There are similarities. The only difference that in neutron decay, kinematic re regime is different. Neutrinos in experiments are GV energies. In new neutron decay, like all particles are at MeV scale, not more than MeV. Yeah. So yeah, uh, to extract parameters of PMNS matrix and determine the violating phase, uh, what uh, we, people do, they, they should muon type of neutrinos, mainly muon type from Fermilab, uh, measure properties at near detectors, flux of incoming neutrinos, and then try to measure flux of muon type of neutrinos surviving probability and uh, appearance flux of electron type of neutrinos uh, quite far away. This far detector is in South Dakota. It's huge, it's up to 280 kiloton of liquid argon in, inside. Uh, comparing rates of uh, these particles to antiparticles, people also can extract CP violating phase. The problem and challenge uh, which uh, faces faced by this experiment that the people don't measure fluxes directly at fixed energies, at far detector, at near detector. Uh, it's slightly more complicated. We can access only some neutrino-induced events, and neutrino-induced events are given by integral over incoming neutrino energy of incoming neutrino flux, which in this case pretty broad in energy, times cross-section of neutrino, and times the response of the detector. So here, when we compare flux at near detector, far detector, uh, we can extract oscillation parameters here. And uh, in order to achieve precision, we have to know both initial flux very well and cross sections as function of energy for appearance uh, for surviving ch channel, disappearance channel, muon type cross sections, and appearance channel for electron type of cross sections. 
And it's a place where radiative corrections can be significant in, in difference of cross-sections between muon type of neutrinos and the electron type of neutrinos. And that's why, uh, yeah, we, we perform this work very, very detailed, very, very, this very, very detailed work. So is the coverage of Earth important in this estimation? What? The coverage of Earth. Curvature of Earth. Um, I think not so much because uh, neutrinos propagate inside the Earth and like they just, when you create them here, they are collimated in some direction, more or less. Uh, they are collimated in many directions, but mainly in some particular way. And then they just propagate through the Earth. So it's uh, like, and then it's, it's maybe important to ca calculate this distance and how matter and what's matter is, is here, but it doesn't enter like really parameter. Yeah, so uh, radiative corrections can change cross sections, and that's why they are important, and we study them. Why they can be important, and are they big or small? So if we consider scattering of neutrino of target of any kind, this target can produce new particles. If we have charged particles, the, we can have photons which are radiated, uh, or we can exchange virtual photons between these charged particles. All such uh, QED diagrams are suppressed. We always have either two charges or charge squared, so they're suppressed like alpha over pi and should be of permeal level. And like, why should we care about radiative corrections at all? But if we have calculations of diagram and we have problem with scale separation, and it's indeed the case, mass of electron is much smaller than mass of muon, and it's much smaller than energy of one GeV. It's like 100 MeV, it's 500 GeV. So we have the good separation of scale, and in calculation of diagrams, there can be single logarithms of ratio of scales, or even double logarithms when we have cuts on final state particles when we measure exclusive observables. In case of single logarithms, corrections can bring this logarithm can bring corrections to percent level. In case of double logarithms, it can bring even up to 10, 20 percent level. And the most important that uh, these logarithms have different ratio of scales, either mass of electron or mass of muon. And due to this difference of scales, radiative corrections and then cross sections of electron and muon types of neutrinos can be very different. And that was motivation of our work. Uh, this channel is pretty important in neutrino oscillations experiment. On this plot, I show cross sections of neutrino divided by neutrino energy as function of the neutrino energy. And uh, different regions contribute to the elastic produ production of resonances with subsequent decays to mesons, and even deep in elastic scattering. Uh, the regions where the dominant flux of hyper-K experiment and Dune are also shown here. Uh, let's... As, and the, the process we are looking at, scattering on nucleons, is the basic process of quasi-elastic region. Uh, to uh, start, I would say that um, let's take a look how it works at three level. Again, it's two to two process, function of two kinematic variable, energy, momentum transfer. Uh, the lepton vertex is known very well, on the left-handed particle center charge current weak interaction, and the proton uh, vertex is matrix element of warp current, which is expressed in terms of two vector form factors and two axial form factors. These vector form factors are related to previous part of work, electron proton scattering, muon proton scattering, atomic spectroscopy by as a spin rotation in proton neutron space. Uh, but uh, these form factors are novel for neutrinos, uh, having, again, this expression, we can calculate unpolarized cross-section, and this the expression for unpolarized cross-section is known from long, long time ago. It's expressed in terms of structure-dependent parameters, A, B, and C. Uh, the important messages first that vector and axial form factors enter with similar weights. They are equally important for neutrino cross-sections. And second message that due to suppression by mass of lepton, the induced field scalar form factor doesn't contribute significantly to cross-sections, and 
at GV energies. And that's why we left only with mainly with contribution of the XL form factor, which is gives the main uncertainty in cross-sections of the, on this for this single process. Where do we take XL form factor? Before last year, or even this year, the main data was coming from deuterium bubble chambers. In this data was had around 3,000 events. Uh, it was neutrino scattering on deuterium. Deuterium is relatively simple. That's why nuclear corrections are small and relatively well under control. And the people extracted from factors from this data by, by many, many groups since that time. But something else happened recently, and Minerva collaboration at, at Fermilab has provided alternative way to extract XL from factor. They have realized scattering of anti-neutrinos on hydrogen with production of muon, muon and the neutron. The idea is uh, simple. They have hydrocarbon as detector, and there is scattering, of course, on hydrogen and on carbon nucleus. But looking on kinematic uh, distribution of final state muon, uh, they were able to distinguish scattering on uh, uh, hydrogen in molecule from scattering on carbon. In case of nucleus, you have scattering <laughs> both in, in uh, you have azimuthal dependence and uh, polar dependence. In, in case of uh, just scattering on hydrogen molecule, it's uh, you have just one scattering plane. And uh, by this, they extracted around 6,000 events uh, on hydrogen and this background around 13,000 events and obtained like new results for XL for factor, which is, uh, and by this, uh, this quite important contribution, new contribution to database of XL from factor. So this is the three process that we want to exchange. Uh, in standard model, you can see it as W boson exchange, yeah. yes. But I, I didn't show it on this uh, diagram because at GV energies, you technically have contact interaction. You can consider start from effective field theory with just four fermions and then calculate matrix elements. But traditional, if you consider a full standard model, is a change of W between some quark inside nucleon change of work state. So the geometry is consistent with standard model? Uh, measurement is consistent so far with standard model. Uh, there is lightest calculation of this object. Before this new measurement of Minerva, when you go to higher momentum transfer, there was difference between lattice calculation and deuterium data. With new measurement of Minerva, difference becomes smaller. But this is still open question. It's not completely clear. Yeah. So your number of MA is a little bit different from the actual A1 vector, which is... Yes, MA, here MA is dipole mass. MA here is dipole mass. It's uh, people parameterize uh, so type of mass has, uh, nothing to, to do with the Excel meson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, scales somehow related because it's all QCD, but uh, it's uh, just way to parameterize form factor like one over one plus Q squared over MA squared squared. So monopole form factor simply wrong? Uh, people use dipole. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, I don't know the details. It doesn't fit data. Monopole definitely doesn't fit data. Dipole fits data slightly better, but still it doesn't, it's not really dipole as you can see here. So here's dipole, here's deviations, but. So this number is more or less standard now? Yeah, it's around one GV squared. So, uh, yeah. So now let's switch to radiative corrections and first uh, how to consider them. In the simplest case is consider nucleon as infinitely heavy particle and consider relativistic leptons. This calculation directly uh, correctly reproduces linear logarithms, which I was talking about. So it correctly reproduces enhancements. Uh, for I throw here a ratio of cross section with radiative corrections to linear order prediction as function of neutrino energy. I include all photons below energy 20 MeV into my observable. 
And in case of uh, just soft photons, it's blue line. Corrections indeed 10, 20%. If I include also collinear photons in direction of electron, and in case of neutrino experiment, most of experiments can distinguish electrons from collinear photons going in their direction. This, the, the observable, the correction becomes smaller. In case of this simplified model, it was possible also to add the contribution of uh, hard regions or, or of all radiated photons allowed by kinematics. And to, uh, by this we obtain correction of order of few percent and it becomes flavor independent. It's the same result for electron and non flavor, but it's not, of course, case of experiment. It's a simple calculation. Now I would like to consider other general features of radiation, radiative corrections. It's about how leptons radiate at energies of a neutrino experiment. Here I fix some of lepton and photon energies to different values and uh, plot angular distribution of radiation with respect to lepton direction. In case of electron, radiation is forwardly picked. In case of muons, radiation is slightly shifted with peak. Not, there is no radiation exactly in, forward, in direction of muon, but peak is slightly shifted. And since resolution of muon, of muons, um, muon angular resolution of muon uh, showers, detectors is relatively small, we do not consider muon jets, but only the kind of electron jets. Since there is separation of scale, we can also work with uh, effective field series, and we consider factorization, and uh, there is hard scale of experiment mass of nucle nucleons and lower scale of masses of particles and soft photon cutoff. In case of QED, factorization gives us product of soft, collinear, and hard function, which describes soft collinear hard regions or soft collinear hard photons. These functions are calculated analytically in QED, and for hard function, we use modeling. Base, and modeling uh, based is mainly on uh, general purpose of quantum field theory. Uh, we reproduce collinear and soft regions of these diagrams, and uh, then this performing this modeling, we have factorization. And uh, after determining hard function, we calculate, uh, we, we do renormalization group evolution and calculate cross-sections at lower energies. And as a result, we did uh, show results for first exclusive observables when we include not all photons into observable, only photons up to some energy, and in case of electrons up to uh, within some cone. Uh, the important point that uh, cross uh, the ratio of cross-section to linear order and flavor ratio have very small uncertainties. And as illustration, I show uncertainty of three-level knowledge of cross-section here. Nevertheless, we don't know three-level well. We predict very well uh, ratios, which is good sign. And by this, we quantify, uh, quantify also flavor ratio of electron type cross-sections to mean type of cross-sections. Besides exclusive observables, we look on inclusive observables where we include all photons allowed by kinematics, but this calculation is done in a model-dependent way because we have to do some modeling for this uh, Hadron physics, and we use the same modeling as for virtual diagrams. Uh, basically, we want to reproduce collinear and soft regions, and by this also we uh, uh, achieve gauge invariance for this radiation and uh, solve some more problems. Uh, and for inclusive observables, the main message here is that correction depends significantly how we determine kinematics in experiment. And in particular, we show it as function of momentum transfer, Q squared, and it can be determined as different of neutrino energy and energy either of just lepton, lepton and photon, or lepton and if there is photon within some direction in within some con with respect to direction of left. Uh, we studied also this electron over muon flavor ratios and uh, uh, we reproduced kinoshita lindberg theorem expansion at low masses of leptons and uh, it's uh, important that our modeling of hard region 
uh, has reproduced this correction. Uh, the size of hadronic uncertainty is smaller than the size of radiative corrections itself. And we also check that nuclear physics effects are of order of hadronic uh, uncertainty for this inclusive ratio integrated over all kinematics. Uh, comparing results to data, we found that uh, uh, corrections uh, are of similar size of uncertainties of experimental, can be of similar size as uncertainties of experimental data. And uh, looking at neutrino type of data, they slightly improve uh, results quite improved description of experiment. These results are for Minerva experiment at Fermilab with flux, which is picked around 6-7 GV uh, in being of longitudinal momentum of uh, lepton in this range as function of transverse uh, momentum of final uh, state leptons. And to conclude, we have uh, in this project for formulated radiative corrections in effective field theory framework, calculated analytically soft and collinear functions and modeled hard functions. And what's important is that even without good knowledge of three level cross sections on simple example of relatively simple example of nucleons, we have shown that we can predict various flavor ratios with very good accuracy. And nowadays we are working on how to apply it to some more uh, experimental questions. Thanks for your attention. I will be happy to answer all questions right now after seminar or anytime this week. If someone wants, just write me an email. I can comment. We can talk. Thank you for the nice talk. Any questions or comments? Simple or too complicated <laughs> <laughs> or too far away. Yeah, but we have met already many questions during the seminar. So maybe, yeah. Also, if you have questions, then he will be here this whole week, right? So. Yeah, I will be here whole week. So I can come anytime, write me email. I'm today in the tea room, coffee room next hour and uh, before we go for dinner, if anyone wants to join for dinner, yeah, you can go and feel free to ask questions during dinner or in the coffee room. Mm -hmm. Not less, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks a lot for...